John Boyko has been here before, and he's written an excellent book about Canada and the U.S. Civil War, Blood and Daring. I hesitated there because my British friends hate the reference to the Civil War because they had one too, not just America. Well, at any rate, um, historian John Boyko, I want to make a confession. I don't know if making confessions to historians has any standing, but would you accept mine? Certainly. All right. When 9-11 happened and when other events happened, uh, when the U.S. blamed Canada and said the terrorists came down from Canada, like many Canadians, I said, well, first of all, that's nonsense. And second of all, they are responsible for policing their own border. It is they who decide who comes into America. And thirdly, we've never been a threat to America. I mean, there was a little raid during the U.S. Civil War, uh, perhaps planned in Montreal, but nothing of any consequence. I was wrong. Having read your book, we were inexorably linked with the Civil War in a number of ways. Could you uh, set us straight, please? We were absolutely involved with the American Civil War in several ways, one of which was that um, we were still part of the British Empire and we were British North America at that time and we were uh, a collection of colonies, Canada, which was Ontario and Quebec glommed together and New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, but all of us were already considering ourselves Canadians and in the American press they well, called let me, us. Let me just stop you, I'm sorry, something has popped up. Is that going to be recorded? Because we sure don't want that. Okay, so we're, we're going... John Boyko has been here before, and he has written a tremendous book called Blood and Daring about the American Civil War. And uh, historian John Boyko, I want to make a confession to you. I'm not sure whether confessions to historians uh, have any standing, but may I do so? Certainly. When 9-11 happened and when other events happened and the Americans worried that the terrorists had come down from Canada or Canada was somehow involved, I said what I think many Canadians did. First of all, nonsense. Second of all, it is Americans who are responsible for patrolling their own border and they decide who gets in. And thirdly, we've never been a threat to America since the War of 1812. In the U.S. Civil War, there may have been a small raid planned in Montreal, but no big deal. But I was wrong, and your book shows me how wrong I was. Please set the record straight. Yes, we were very much a threat to the United States in that we were a part of the British Empire at the time, and we were uh, a couple of uh, very small, broke, disparate colonies. Canada was Quebec and Ontario, both basically southern Ontario and southern Quebec, um, united as one colony called Canada, and the uh, Maritime Provinces, which were... Uh, were colonies at the time too, but also referred to by the American press as Canadians. And when the Civil War began, the British declared themselves neutral, which meant that we were automatically neutral, but we were officially neutral, but unofficially very much engaged. We were engaged because thousands, over 40,000 Canadians, went down and fought in the American Civil War, most for the North. We were involved because we a number of companies both in Canada and in the Maritimes manufactured weapons and arms and other things and sold them to the United States. Uh, we were involved because a spy ring, you, you referenced Montreal, a spy ring ran from Montreal and a Confederate spy ring in Toronto and in Montreal that ran those raids and a number of other things that were not harming the North significantly, but certainly distracting and, and causing them to bring soldiers North as opposed to fighting in the South. We were also involved because the for one of the first things that Abraham Lincoln did in the war was to put a blockade on along the coast so that uh, cotton could not be taken to Europe and, and the money used to fight the war. And we ar arranged so that we brought those uh, ships, those southern ships that were trying to run the blockade, into Halifax and gave them all the support and food and supplies they needed. And then when the northern ships that were chasing them came 
we sold them happily food and supplies and everything else. And so a number of other things that I could bring up, but I think that's enough to say that we were very much involved and involved in a way that very much irked the Northerners and, and, and uh, Abraham Lincoln himself. Now you have uh, skipped over something because you're so familiar with the topic. You mentioned 40,000 Canadians fought in the U.S. Civil War, mainly on the Northern side. Uh, yes. Let me pause on that and say, I believe from memory, it was 5,000 Canadians fought in Korea with uh, the Americans and the United Nations force, and about 5,000 fought in Vietnam, uh, not as allies, but as simply individuals who went and, uh, and registered. Uh, and so that was almost 10 times the number, almost 100 years before. An amazing number of Canadians. That's right. Yeah, uh, and many of them fought for many different reasons. Uh, very few fought, as many people believe, just to get a little bit of money in their pocket. Many fought because they admired the cause. They admired that we were fighting, or the United States, the Northern States was fighting in order to eradicate slavery. Uh, many fought for, for their own reasons. Many young men just believed, as many young men have always done, that it would be glorious to fight in a war and come back in a uniform. Uh, but the fact that 40,000 Canadians at that time, when the population of the colonies was quite low, just about 6 million, was certainly uh, remarkable. Now, you've just disagreed with Lincoln, and um, I can't interview him, of course, but Lincoln's first inaugural uh, said he had uh, no uh, position on slavery, had no right to abolish it. He would even entrench it in the Constitution. Uh, he later said the Civil War was about union, not about slavery. But you've said it's about slavery, which certainly that was the uh, major outcome. Um, would many of those 40,000 have thought they were fighting to uh, liberate uh, uh, American, African Americans in, in the South, or would they have thought it was uh, for some other reason? Many of the Canadians who went down and fought were fighting for slavery because despite what Lincoln was saying, and I'll go into that in a second, many believed quite correctly that this was going to determine whether slavery would continue in the United States or not. Um, many Canadians lost faith in Lincoln when he said that, when he said a number of times that this is not about freeing the slaves, this is about preserving the Union. And he said that, um, for the first couple of years in the war. And that led to many Canadians turning against the North. Almost every Canadian newspaper, both in Canada and in the Maritimes, was pro-South. Many of the um, pro-Southern people in New Brunswick were very adamant about their pro-Confederate uh, ties and their uh, their attitudes. Um, when there were major victories for the South, and there were many at the, uh, the outset of the war, there were parades in, in Halifax and in Moncton and in St. John. Uh, we were very much uh, officially neutral, but many, especially in the, the political and economic elite and newspapers, believed that, that the South should win. If the South won, after all, that would mean that the North and, and South would form two countries. In fact, many people believe that the United States would shatter into many countries and become a Europe with, with small countries uh, rather than one sea to sea country. And that would benefit Canada and that would benefit Britain. And so all of this meant that there are a great number of factors that led to newspapers and business people and, and the and the political elite saying they believed one thing, and it certainly led a number of people to have a number of different motivations to go fight in the war. But it was uh, the notion that this was going to end slavery. And in 1863, when Lincoln finally came out with the Emancipation Proclamation, that confirmed that the thing was actually about slavery. And in um, 1860 to 65, uh, regrettably, uh, slavery would have been a living memory in Canada. Uh, there are still, uh, uh, there is still evidence of slavery uh, in, in this country, in, in you know, the nooks and crannies of the country where slaves were, were held. And that's kind of a, uh, an embarrassing aspect of Canadian history. And would that have affected people's support of the South? 
Absolutely. There are a number of Canadians that were uh, prominent Canadians, like George Brown, the leader of the Reform Party that became the Liberal Party, and the owner-editor of the Globe, was very much involved with the abolitionist movement in Canada, which was a very strong movement trying to advocate for the United States to get rid of slavery, as we had um, previously, uh, about a generation before. And so, yeah, the, the, those memories of, of when we were a sl slave state uh, were very much a part of the notion that we had to do all we could to get the United States to change their ways. Now, you've used an interesting technique in your book, and you've uh, looked at the U.S. Civil War through the lens of several people and their personal experiences, uh, some very famous, such as uh, Seward, uh, who bought Alaska, known as Seward's Folly, John A. MacDonald, of course, Lincoln, uh, and, and some others. Can, can you give us a, a sentence or two about each one of those characters and how they fit into this uh, broader narrative? Well, the first, uh, yeah, the, the trick that I was trying to use, if I could be so bold as to call it a trick, is I believe that the topic is, is important, but simply because a topic is important it doesn't make it necessarily interesting. And for readers to engage with something, it needs to be interesting. So what I did was I tried to find uh, people who were themselves interesting that would invite readers into the story. So the first was John Anderson. And John Anderson was a slave that was born a slave in the United States and uh, through the Underground Railroad, which we know was neither underground nor a railroad, but we know what we're talking about, uh, came to Canada. And when he arrived in Canada, he did very well and uh, formed his own company, bought his own house, uh, learned to read, which was illegal to teach black people to read in the United States, and did very well. And then was arrested in Canada by uh, agents who came from the United States to arrest him and take him back. And we follow his story and through that story, we look at how Canada was involved in the Civil War's cause because we were a shining example of everything that the South said could not exist. That is, black people, African Americans, um, did not want to be free were incapable of being free, didn't want to be educated, and could not be educated and because they were basically subhuman. That was the foundation of the southern states and the slaveholding states. And here we were with thousands of freed slaves who were doing very well, thank you very much. They had to shut that down. And if they were successful in extraditing John Anderson and bringing him back, then that would have proven that the Underground Railroad was dead, that the United States could arrest fugitive slaves on the streets of Toronto as well as Boston or New York. And so that was essential. Now, each of the people that I, I talk about in the book, um, I try to use as an example of how one aspect of the Civil War uh, affected Canada and Canada affected the Civil War. I could go through all of them if you wish, but... Uh, well, let, let me say that the trick worked. Uh, and it, it, it made the history uh, alive for me. So yes, a sentence or two on the others, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, Seward uh, was an interesting man in that he was running for, he was a senator, and he was a very powerful senator from New York State, and he was running for president. And when he uh, ran for president, it was very much looking like he was going to win until Lincoln snuck through and won the nomination and then the presidency. Uh, and he was uh, po appointed as Lincoln's Secretary of State. Uh, what was interesting about Seward, I think, is that he believed, as many Americans did at the time, that Canada should become part of the United States. Manifest destiny was such that the United States not only would, but should own everything from the North Pole to, uh, to Mexico. And so what he was demonstrating was that he would use Canada's involvement in the Civil War, as I've described before, as a way in which he would forward his uh, dream of taking all of Canada. And he, you mentioned, purchased Alaska, or, or at least he, he worked so that the United States uh, purchased Alaska uh, in 1867. Uh, on the very same day, by the way, that Queen Victoria signed the um, document, the BNA Act. And the reason that he gave 
the American Congress to, to pony up the money in order to buy Alaska was this will be the first step in surrounding that rump of a country up there of Canada uh, and therefore eventually sweeping it into the Atlantic and making uh, it all the United you're, States. You're testing my uh, memory, but I think there was an international commission uh, that voted whether Alaska should become Canadian or American, and Britain uh, sided with the Americans. Yeah, it was over the border, yeah, and they very much sided with the Americans, and they sided with the Americans many, many times in many issues. Uh, another person that I look at um, was a person who uh, signed up for the war. She uh, was uh, in working in the United States as a Bible salesman, and signed up for the war and did very well. Um, became a nurse. Uh, all nurses were male at that time and, and was uh, involved in a great number of battles. And when the, uh, the battles and the nursing was simply not enough, volunteered to take even more risks as a, as a message uh, rider, which was incredibly dangerous, riding on horseback, taking general's messengers from one person to another, and that wasn't exciting enough, signed up to be a spy, ran 10 missions over uh, lines, and and brought all kinds of in interesting and important information back, uh, and only when she uh, fell ill uh, and had to um, hospitalize herself um, only then did this person say, okay, I've read that my name is listed as a deserter. I know what I will do. And that person took off the uniform and put on the dress because she was a woman who was disguised as a man throughout uh, the war. And her... John, I'm glad that you clarified because you could have been accused of political incorrectness when you said she was working as a Bible salesman. Right. That was indeed correct and not politically incorrect. Yes, uh, uh, Emma Edmonds, Sir Emma Edmonds. And uh, so I use her as an example of, uh, one, the misogyny of the time. Women could not be nurses because they couldn't be trusted. They're not smart enough, emotionally stable enough. And oh my God, if they were ever to see the male body at any point, that would be scandalous. Um, so she is uh, used to, as an example of uh, the changing role of women because halfway through the war, all of a sudden it was decided that women are just fine to be nurses and to do many other roles. And she is one of those 40,000 Canadians that fought. And that allows me to talk about the Canadians that fought in the war. Another is um, Jacob Thompson. And Jacob Thompson was uh, in the cabinet uh, of the previous administration. He was the interior secretary, and he was a, a southerner. And halfway through the war, after 1863, with the defeat of the Confederates at Vicksburg and at Gettysburg, uh, the president of the Confederacy decided that what we need to do is build up a force in Canada that would do raids into the north and distract the northern soldiers. And in, in responding to these raids, they would have to take soldiers from the front lines and move them north for the northern border. And Jacob Thompson was put in charge of that. He was given a great deal of money, set up headquarters in Montreal and Toronto. And this Confederate spy ring openly operated there and uh, ran a number of raids that resulted in the Great Lakes becoming a, a, a war uh, camp again with all of the ships that were, that were battling just like in the War of 1812. 1812, it was decided there would be no battleships on the Great Lakes that was thrown away as a result of what was happening from Canada. Um, and the St. Albans raid that you referenced earlier um, was a raid in which uh, Jacob Thompson's people raided into uh, St. Albans and, and uh, killed people, robbed banks. And so what was happening was the North was looking at Canada as an enemy because this was happening over, over the border from Canada. John, it's, it's a little hard to benchmark threats, especially 145 years later. But it seems to me that the organization of those cells in Canada, the um, organization of actual raids as incompetent as they ended up being, was as much a threat to America as, say, 
the Japanese incendiary bombs during World War II, uh, German submarines off the East Coast in World War II, uh, the Weather Underground, um, uh, other terrorist organizations. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say it was a similar threat, would you? Yeah, I agree. And, and the threat was real. Um, Sir John A. Macdonald, or he wasn't Serge, but he was John A. Macdonald at that point, was the de facto prime minister. Uh, there was political shenanigans going on, but he was essentially the prime minister. His official title was attorney general. Sent uh, the finance minister, a man named Galt, to Washington to speak to Lincoln. And he met with Lincoln, and the two of them talked about what was uh, all of these raids, and they talked about uh, the involvement of Canada in the Civil War, as, as I mentioned. And Lincoln said that Canada and Britain would very much regret after the war the involvement of Canada, and action would be taken. It was as clear a threat as Lincoln could make. It was very clear to Galt that what Lincoln was saying was that when we're done with the South, we're turning our soldiers around and we're taking Canada. And, and of course- Lincoln was not given to direct threats. He was given to uh, uh, anecdotes, prevarication, uh, metaphor, etc. Yeah, unlike uh, the current American president, he was very clever with his use of words and, um, and clear in, in his language so that Galt returned to Canada and, and said publicly, Lincoln was a great man, a, a terrific raconteer, and he offers no threat to Canada whatsoever. Privately, in a letter to his wife and a letter to, uh, to MacDonald, he said, look out, they're coming. We are in a lot of trouble. Now, that led to the next uh, stage of the, the book and of the story and to George Brown. George Brown, as I said before, was the uh, leader of what became the Liberal Party and uh, called the Reform Party at that point, and also the editor of The Globe, very powerful person, member of parliament. And he was one of the ones who had been pushing for confederation for a long time. What we need to do is to get uh, the, the, these poor uh, colonies that are that are broken politically and broke economically uh, in the Maritimes of Canada and bring them together. For years it had been talked about, Galt was one of the ones that talked about it, others. Um, Brown, who hated MacDonald, he and MacDonald literally hated each other as people. They were more than just political rivals. But Brown encouraged MacDonald, Carchet, McGee, others, uh, the people that we know as the Fathers' Confederation, into a room to form a committee that we could finally look at whether Confederation should happen or not. And Brown was an interesting man in that he was large for his, his time and a dominant figure of personality as well. He got these gentlemen into the room, turned and very theatrically locked the door put the key in his pocket and said, no one leaves this room except through me. We are going to arrange this now. And that was really the beginning of Canada coming together. And one of the main reasons that Canada came together when it did and how it did is that the threat from Lincoln, the threat from the Civil War was very much real. At the same time as Britain and the group called the Little Englanders over in Britain were saying, we're, we've had enough of you, Canada. You are too expensive. It looks like you're going to drag us into a war with Britain. You are very much on your own. They ended trade deals. They were trying to sever their ties with us. So we are going to be on our own, and we are threatened, very much threatened from the United States. We've got to do something, and that something was confederation. That's a, a date that is sometimes missed by people that... While, yes, we formed our country in 1867, the country was really uh, discussed and agreed upon in 1864. Well, that's right in the middle of the American Civil War. There's a reason for that. It's not a coincidence. Now, John, this is not a game show, although you would do well on one, I'm sure. <laughs> but wasn't it Disraeli who said Canada was a yoke around Britain's neck? Absolutely. And he was one of the, they called them little Englanders. That is, we are going to uh, withdraw from the world. We're, we are going to get rid of India, get rid of Australia, get rid of New Zealand, all these troublesome colonies. And Canada was simply one of those colonies that needed to be gotten rid of. Um, yeah, Disraeli was increasing his power in, in uh, 
in Britain at this time. And that's, as I said, one of the reasons why we realized and we were like a teenager. Mom was kicking us out of the house. We couldn't move next door because the neighbor's house was on fire. We had to build our own house. And I digress, but I think many of Disraeli's papers are at uh, Queen's University in Kingston. Yes. Um, and uh, I guess we could also say, based on your research, that Canada was formed in great part by victims of kidnapping. Yeah, I suppose that's true. All right. Were there, uh, did we miss anybody from your book? Well, we miss McDonald. Oh, yeah, of course. John A. McDonald. I remember him. <laughs> um, yeah, Sir John A. McDonald, I bring up at the end, not so much, I, I talk about him, of course, of bringing the country together. He was, he was our essential man that resulted in Canada becoming Canada and not part of the United States. His negotiating skills, his charm that brought disparate people who were political enemies together um, and uh, allowed it to happen. He was the one that, as much as hand wrote much of the Constitution, that based us on what was best of the British system uh, and federalism, what was best of the American system. And so he's in the book talking about that. And many times through his speeches in 1864, all the way up to its ratification, and finally uh, in 1867 when it became real, he mentioned the Americans and the threat from the Americans as one of the main reasons why we needed to do this. The other reason that he's there is uh, um, I believed, and many people believe, I think, uh, that, okay, the Civil War is over in 1865, so all threats are gone. We formed our country and moved merrily along. But the threats did not end there because the United States was still quite angry with Canada and with Britain because of all of the, the Canadians did uh, in the war that I've mentioned, and there, there was more in the book that I could go on to. Um, but w Britain also had helped the South because it had purchased ships and given them or sold them to the South, and it had manufactured ships, and then through dummy corporations, they became part of the, Ameri of the Confederate Navy. Uh, the most powerful and uh, deadly of these ships was called the Alabama. So what the Americans did, this is after the Civil War was over, Lincoln was dead, uh, Grant is now president, and uh, this man named Fish was now the Secretary of State. He basically added up all of the damage that British ships had done, added up all of the, and came up with a, a figure that was astronomical in the billions of dollars that said, Britain, you owe us this money, pay up. Britain then got together and with uh, in, uh, the ambassador of Britain got together with Fish in Washington and they said, well, tell you what, we'll make a deal. Give us Canada and we'll write it off. Well, they formed a commission, uh, five Americans and five Brits, and the Brits were very good to count Sir John as one of them. We met in Washington and over a number of weeks hammered out a deal and MacDonald was so brilliant in those negotiations that Canada swap was taken off the table. And so and this is in 1871 that the Washington Treaty finally enabled Canada to move beyond the Civil War. And for the first time, Canada was recognized officially as a country because in order for this treaty to be ratified, then it had to be ratified in Britain, it had to be ratified through the American Congress, and the British and the Canadian Parliament had to ratify it as well. MacDonald took this so seriously that he even quit drinking for six weeks. Wow. And uh, we came how close to becoming war reparations? Uh, we came very close. The, the four Brits and the five Americans went into that room in Washington very much uh, intent upon taking Canada in a swap for those reparations. It was and only Donald's cleverness and his refusal to back down that resulted in that going to a, a Geneva conference that uh, eventually figured it all out. Well, so much more to talk about, but one uh, final thing. It's, it's amazing to me to think that um, Jefferson Davis, uh, wife, and then he went to Montreal. Some very famous generals whose names would be known were in Canada and living very prominently after the war. And um, I used to live in um, a little wee place outside of Sherbrooke, Quebec, in uh, Jean Charest's original area. It was called Bon yes. Secours, and we were very close to Lennoxville, where mm -hmm. Bishop's uh, College and Bishop's uh, University exist. 
and uh, Valcour, where the snowmobile was invented. Mm -hmm. And Jefferson Davis's uh, children went to that school, I believe. Right. So talk about those very famous Southerners who uh, came to Canada. Well, a great number of the generals left, and um, Jefferson Davis, uh, who was imprisoned after the war, uh, and when he um, finally was let out, um, escaped to uh, Canada. And uh, one of the generals was General Pickett, famous of Pickett's Charge uh, at Gettysburg. Uh, who, what was the turning point in that battle and the turning point in the war. Had the South won Gettysburg, then uh, who knows uh, whether the South would have prevailed and who knows what would have happened then. So a number of those generals came and when uh, Jefferson Davis was in Canada, he began, began writing a, uh, a number of books um, that became a number of books and a number of the generals began writing some of the books as well. Oh no, you have the book. There we go. And uh, what those books ended up doing was starting something uh, called the Lost Cause. And what that established is that the South did not fight the Civil War about slavery, these books said. Um, we were fighting simply to protect ourselves from this faraway government that, that, that wasn't looking out for us. And, and slavery really had nothing to do with it. It was all about fighting for states' rights. That was the myth that uh, led to the erection of a number of Civil War statues throughout the South in the 1920s, again in the 1950s. And it is a, a, a notion that is still very much prevalent in the American South when they fight against any program in the United States, like Obamacare or something, where again, this is that far away Northern government that is telling us what to do. Well, that myth still very much prevalent in the United States. Where was it born? In Montreal, in Lenoxville. Now, this is the book that uh, John made reference to, and it is a very thick volume by Jefferson Davis, uh, and it's three volumes. It is so old that it can't uh, be reprinted. It had to be cut up, photographed, and then uh, reprinted, but yeah. uh, it is a good volume. I'll confess I haven't read it, but it's on my list to read. Uh, John, we I've, I've read at it. There are many books that I've read at and not read. <laughs> um, we could go um, on and on, but there is a limit even to um, uh, uh, SD card <laughs> capacity <laughs> in these days. I also note that you haven't written every one of those books on your shelf behind you, but you have written others we must talk about. So come on back soon. I'd be happy to. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's check that. Uh, it's a little, di the prose is a little difficult, eh, John? Oh, boy, yeah. He may have been a good president, but he wasn't much of a writer. <laughs> and those reenactors yeah, adopted. It's a shame that people like Lincoln and Kennedy didn't live to write because they were brilliant writers, and imagine what they would have written. Yeah, in retrospect. <laughs>